Our final speaker today is Jeff Stewart. Is he here? Oh, there you are. Um, Jeff Stewart is the Director of Digital Infrastructure and Emerging Technology at the Harvard Art Museums. For the past 17 years, he has worked at museums with museum data. He provides leadership and guidance on the use of a wide range of technologies at the museums to reshape the museum experience inside and out. And Jeff will provide a number, <coughs> excuse me, of interactive visualization demos of the Harvard Art Museum's data at the reception. So please help me welcome Jeff Stewart. Hi, everyone. Uh, that's me. And I'm going to talk about some of the work we're doing at the Harvard Art Museums. We are right around the corner. We're a museum of around a quarter of a million art objects and lots of data. So I'm just going to just just jump right in. Um, so what I'm really interested in is changing the perception of what a museum is, what a museum collection is, what art objects really are. And uh, to that end, I'm going to talk about some of the projects where we've been creating uh, data-rich imagery from data-rich imagery and other data sources. And I'll touch on the impetus for some of the things that you'll see up on the screen. So um, I have a bunch of visuals that are hopefully you'll find interesting and you can sort of zone out on if my talking is boring for you. But let's get started here. So um, sort of picking up on a lot of themes that have already been presented here, um, we start with an object. Um, when thinking about um, doing any kind of producing any kind of visual information, so here we so we, here we have a rough sketch of what an object is to us at the museums. Um, it's a whole bunch of different facets and attributes, and these really represents points of view and doors and points of entries and perspectives for for drawing people in to items in the collection. <laughs> I can't tell you how much I abuse this photo because it really, 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 really underlines to me that um, <laughs> the material we deal with is so subjective and we never know what people are going to find interesting. <laughs> so, you know, going back to this notion of all these doors and, and points of entry, it's like, well, how do we really make use of those to, to broaden our audience and make all this great cultural material available to people? Um, it's a great photograph. Not much to say on that. Um, okay, so the rest of the slides are about the experiments we're doing in producing visuals that make what we do available and accessible for diverse vantage points. Okay, but before I really get into the visuals, um, we have to understand a little bit about where our data comes from, how it's managed, the systems that are used, the shape of it, how we currently use it, and so on. So just a quick, quick uh, glance at some of the interfaces which we, we use to produce uh, data about our collections, like our cataloging system, or the tables behind it. And from there, you know, we do things like we put it back out on our website, and it takes, you know, it's like being pushed through, through cheese grater or like a sieve or something, and it's changing shape and form, and, and just that constantly is altering your perception of, of what you're thinking about museums or objects on a whole, and you know, as you flip through our objects, you know, you realize the complexity and the density of the information we produce, just in all the systems we use for our day-to-day -day activity of managing a collection and, and, and doing scholarship. And you get to things like our Van Gogh portrait, and you go to our page online, and you get this thing that's seven miles long, and it's fun if you want to read through it, and maybe not fun at all, because um, it's just it's a lot of information. Um, so there you have a sense of the depth of the data that we collect and produce and ultimately share. Um, so for the remainder, I'm just going to take us through a roller coaster ride of our collection and how we're thinking about the museum as a collection, collections as collections, objects as elements of a collection and items on their own. And we're going to move through the macro and the micro and all kinds of fun stuff. So let's just jump back to the thing that people often associate with objects at our museum, which is the thing itself, uh, the Van Gogh portrait, which you can go see on the first floor, uh, right around the corner, gallery uh, 1220, specifically. But we can start to do really fun things if we want to, if we just sort of poke and prod at the at the data a little bit, and you know, like super rudimentary stuff. You write an algorithm, and you can get all, you can you know, throw all the colors from the image of Van Gogh into buckets and generate some new imagery out of that existing imagery. 
you know, rudimentary data visualization, nothing sophisticated. But if we mine those same applications a little bit further for that one object, you, you can just, you can get these different perspectives on the Van Gogh itself. Here is the Van Gogh over the last six years of its life and all the things that have been happening to it. Things like um, people viewing it on our website or our staff editing the records in our collections database or movement through the physical spaces in our building. Again, nothing really uh, too dramatic. But we could just mine it a little bit further and produce even more interesting imagery, like the Van Gogh being that big dot there. And we can trace the paths to all the other objects. It's occupied the same physical space with over, over its lifetime. And we can trace the frequency of the times it's occupied the spaces and represent them by thickness of lines and the sizes of the dots and then you know, group them together by other types of material and start to get a real sense of the life of this one particular object in context of the collection that it's a part of, which happens to be the wartime collection. So there he is up there. Again, all these gallery 1220 right around the corner. Go see him in person. Um, we can start to put the Van Gogh in context and give it a little bit more uh, broader <coughs> picture of what it is, which is part of this wartime collection. And we can take the same notions we applied to the same Van Gogh and apply it across the collection. And, and, and some fun things start to emerge, like the fact that you'll notice that we have a lot of no image available icons. Well, in this case, that's because they have um, their, their rights restricted by their, uh, you know, the people that own the copyright to them. And we can show you small images on our own website. But for the point of this demonstration, I could do this and not show them to you and give you, give you this little glimpse of, well, we can't show you the actual images of the objects, but we can show you the colors we extracted from the images. And it just gives you different ways to approach the collection and the items. And we could take that same notion of the graphs of activity and we could apply it across the whole wartime collection. 2009 to 2015, you can see which objects are more appealing to others by the amount of activity that's transpired on them. We could do fun things like step back a little bit further and put the wartime collection in context. Well, if you look down here at this bubble here, that's gallery 1220 and all those items are represented by those colored dots. And the bubbles around them represent the other galleries. Gallery, 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 object, 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 object. And then the floor, the whole first floor of the museum, the whole second floor of the museum, the whole third floor of the museum, the big bubble being the whole museum itself. And we can start to generate all of this new imagery straight out of the data that we have and manage on a day-to-day -day basis without even thinking. It's just part of our jobs. So there, there you have the whole museum in one quick glance. Colors mean things. Talk to me later if you want to know details. These are online. They're interactive. They're all driven from the API. We have the same data set you can access and build these same things you want if you really are inclined to do that kind of thing. Step back even further and put the wartime collection in context of the entire museum. This collection of a quarter of a million things. Stretch your imagination and think of every pixel on the screen as an item in our collection. And think of each item in the wartime collection as those ones that are turned on. And so you get to see the place of that small collection with the whole of 250,000 other works of art in one quick, quick glance. Here's what gets fun for me, because now we, we can add more dimensions to the data we're dealing with in the imagery we're producing of it. So let's add the third dimension and yet the fourth dimension and look at the entirety of the collection across time and space, where we're actually rendering an aggregate view of all the page views going back from 2009 where each little square that's lit up represents an object. The ones that are white are objects that have never been viewed on our website. And you can see quickly, we got a tremendous number of outliers that, for one reason or another, people happen upon those pages. And then vast valleys, or as I like to call them, the great plains of nothingness. <laughs> so which helps us tease out, like, OK, what's our collection been up to? What's it been doing? Where can we focus more on? Why, should, why do we own these things if nothing's going on with them? You know, it just starts to, starts to prompt new questions about what we do with our, with our collection. Okay. 
And of course, you could take that same notion, you could take the same whole collection, and you could just resort the grid. There's, there's specific sorts to e each of these grids. One is by classification, or one is by um, division, or something like that. And you could play them back at the same time and you know, try to get, gain new insights or maybe develop new questions. And that's just layering page views for every object in one graph, but we could add even more dimensions. And we could look at the entire collection at once, but we can look at a whole variety of activities that have been transpiring on an object by object basis on a daily basis. Each color means something different. It's been viewed on our website. It's been physically moved from locations within our storage or within our museum itself. It's been edited in our database. It's been sent to conservation all that good stuff. And again, these are interactive visualizations. I have some canned videos just showing you, um, you know, almost a quarter million objects and all the activity. So just days whizzing by and we can see very clearly certain patterns like nothing happens on the weekends as you might expect. Um, we see a lot of blue flashing by in the 2009-10 area because we we're emptying our building in preparation for construction of our new building. So it just proves the, the things you've already assumed about what you're doing at your institution. And from there, we could sort of step back and take this, uh, sort of go back down in from the, looking at the entirety of the collection to looking at things that are just currently on view on our website. And applying a little more of a sense of aesthetics and just sort of starting to blur the lines between uh, practical data visualization and, and art ishness, however you want to classify it. Um, and take a more playful approach to how we could introduce our collection to people. Again, everything here has a purpose. Every dot is an item that's currently on view in our museum. Every dot is colored by the primary or most dominant color we've extracted from the images of it. Every dot well, in this visualization, every dot is just set free on a random path, and they have flocking behavior. So that's why you're seeing weird clustering happening. Uh, here's a second version of it where each, each one, you can see the path or the trail it's leaving behind. Um, you'll see trails drop off because the trail's are, length is dictated by the aggregation of the page views of each object. So there's, all of the data is feeding in to the system to give these things new life and behavior for appealing to people who like this kind of stuff, like me. Uh, if you come visit us, you can see a different variation where the things actually cluster and flock to the locations they are in the building on the floors they are in the building. So the visualization is actually starting to draw, draw the building purely from the data that we're collecting from the systems we use to manage the collection. Fun stuff. And of course, this is all based on our metadata, so why not show like the titles for the objects and all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> Okay, yeah, all these are interactive and running out in the hall. And of course, I really am keen on astronomy, so why not model our collection on the notion of solar systems where we can segment everything by classification and we can use the, the quantities of the, of the, of the um, types of material to um, scale and, and arrange solar systems. So the suns at the heart of each one is scaled by the proportion by the number of items of that type that are in the collection, and then it's subdivided by, in this case, century, where the lines are proportionally fanning out based on the percentage within that section of the collection, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's a fully navigable universe of, um, of our collection. And then we could take it beyond the fourth dimension, or I don't, I don't know what dimension you would call this, but we could bring it back to reality. We could take it off the screen and put the screen in a physical space where people that could then interact with the virtual space and the, you get this whole weird cycle thing going on. So actually this is the fifth floor of our building. It's called the Lightbox Gallery. It's our public research and development space. We have a pretty large video wall, a projection system, and it's a networked environment where we're just starting to scratch the surface on how physical computing could be used in an environment like this. 
on hardware and soft and, and that you can write your own visualization applications and just run them up on the big screen and play around and get a feel for working on a canvas of that many pixels, something we don't normally have access to, but in fact, we now have access to it and try to make it as available to people to come in and play on as we can. Um, and it gets used for artist talks and we get to tinker with all kinds of different concepts for visualizing collections and material in this space. And I am going to wrap it up. There's another view of everything that's on, there's another view of everything that's on view in the museum in one of the interactive applications that run up there. And that's all for now. Thank you.